what I'd like to spend some time with you this afternoon is, it's really interesting when we do this, um, we're very happy to, as Kim said before, to sponsor the pro bono salary survey. We understand it's a really important piece of uh, thought leadership in the, in the sector. And uh, when we do, it gets us thinking about what we do. So I'm a, an advisor to small business and not-for-profit sector now. And, and often when we look at those entities or those organisations, a large part of their spend every year is, is on the payroll, is on the, the remuneration. <clears throat> and so it's, it's really important to us about how do you get the most out of that. So we started, uh, one of my colleagues, Kate Bleckage, who couldn't be here, uh, she's the fortunate one, she's in Fiji. Um, so she and I started about two and a half years ago. We started working with teams around efficiency and starting to challenge them. And we, what we worked out is that we, a lot of the time leaders and managers don't actually understand the true makeup of who's in their team. So we hire people uh, based on resume, we hire them based on interview, and we start get a feel for them, but we don't actually find that there's, generally there's not necessarily a lot, a lot of alignment amongst that team without something else. So we started to try and explore a tool that we could use to help us in our work as we go through this, this change management process, which is really so important. We believe in, in a modern age where we're expected to do more with less, uh, that the, the change is not only constant, but it's coming at us at a much faster and much more, uh, much, much faster rate than it's ever done in history. So we found this thing called PI, but really what we were thinking, the question we, we started to ask ourselves is, how do we really, how well do we really know our team members? Um, how do we ensure we recruit the right people? Um, but if we've got people on the team, how do we ensure that we get the best out of the individuals in the team? And is there a way we can learn a little bit more and really understand how to get the most of them? And I think some of the points that Andrew was making before about how to motivate people, we often go straight back, we go to that default back pocket and say, we give everybody a bonus, and that's going to be the, the goal that gets them over the line. It's interesting when Andrew says that, he you know, made the point that um, people come to expect an amount of money, and if the amount of money is less than that, then it's not going to get what you... It, it, when you set out at the beginning of the year, it doesn't hit on the aspect that you were hoping to as a motivational tool. What we've also discovered in our work as we started to work with more and more organisations is that not everybody's motivated by the same things. And so, and particularly uh, in some of the smaller businesses that I work with, or the not-for-profit sector in particular, is that people are there for often different reasons, or they're motivated by different things, they're engaged in different ways. In fact, their default behaviour is, is somewhat uh, not necessarily aligned to everybody else in the team. And when we don't understand each other, we struggle to get the best performance from our team. So this is where we start. Um, so the PI tool as it is, which is what I'm going to spend a little bit of time taking you through this afternoon, it's been around, it's, it's, it's like a lot of the uh, site tools, it's been around since the early 50s, mid 50s. It's a very widely used tool, which is why we like it. Um, it's used in a lot of countries. It's covered off in various languages, which we've tested. We have a lot of, uh, several of our employees don't speak, uh, well, they speak English clearly. Um, but they also speak a second language, and we've tested it. We've they've asked them to do it in their, their native tongue, if you, if you like. And so we, we know that it's actually reliable and valid in, 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 um, in, in across culture and, and language, which becomes really important when you start to think about the makeup of the Australian um, workforce in, in, in our modern age. Um, basically, though, they say it's growing in its, uh, in its usage. Uh, the stat that they share with us is there's a PI completed somewhere in the world at about every 30 seconds. So, in the time that we're here today, um, it's about 120 being, being completed. And I hope by the end of the, of the session, some of you might be interested in getting yours done. Um, who's using it? To give it some credibility, uh, a lot of the largest companies in the world, so shipping companies, cereal companies, earth moving companies. So, it doesn't seem to, that, that, it, that when people start thinking about how you motivate your employees around behaviour, it's not sector, sector specific. Um, and of course, we're now um, Australia's most client focused accounting advisory business. We use it as well. Um, and we've started to really understand how our team is motivated and how they're going to behave based on this tool. So, when you're going to recruit somebody, um, there's a whole lot of stuff that you could consider. So, there's the, this is the whole person broken out in a pie chart. So, you have their natural intelligence, their education and training, and Andrew hit on some of that as how much training a person might have and how relevant that might be to a given organisation. Their basic knowledge and skills, some of their experience, attitudes, values, interests, 
literacy and language, and their physical health and wellbeing. The PI piece hits on their motivating needs, behaviours and drivers. So it's the thing that is going on in their head every day, within their person, uh, that is driving their behaviour around whether or not they're going to be fully engaged in what they're doing with you or whether they're not. And uh, having an understanding of that, we have found, is going to be a lot more effective in getting the change that we require, because as, as external advisors to our clients, we're often helping them to change something in their business, and they're expecting some payback from us, so some, some kind of outcome. So if we can start to get them to talk to each other and work together in a more effective way, we tend to find that we get better outcome. So pretty much, the, that, that everything on that pie chart, you'd be pretty much interested in um, understanding before, it would, would that be fair? If, you wanted to know all those things about an employee, somebody sitting in front of you for a job, anybody doing a job interview this afternoon? Either attending one? Okay, Alison, what, are you going for a job? Or are you, are you? <laughs> doing an interview with somebody at 5 o'clock. <laughs> for you to get the job or then? No, I'm with All right, okay, so would you, will that be important to you? Thank you very much. Sitting next to me all lunchtime, isn't that very convenient <laughs> indeed? And that wasn't even a plan, I promise you. Hand on heart. Um, but a lot of those things that we, we consider out the, the, the non-PI sector, they're really important, but if you can't get people to understand their motivations and behaviours, you really might be missing out on something very important. So the PI piece will help you understand how someone needs to, someone responds to their environment and the people in it. So if everybody starts to understand the, the, the understanding of their behavior, own behaviour a little bit better, and <coughs> Just proving that I drink lime Kool-Aid, that's my PI. You'll see it's got a fair few notes on it. Basically, I'll take it around with me. That Coke, that sits in my folder and just reminds me what my management style is and what, uh, what my opportunities for improvement might be on a day-to-day -day basis. So the point is, if I start to understand myself a little better and then other people are understanding themselves a little better, we might start to understand a little bit more about what motivates them to action. So I was interested when Andrew's going through the, the motivating on a budget is we might actually have different, um, particularly where he said, whether you cut them in the check, do you give them the cash or do you send them on a conference or some kind of training? <coughs> Having an understanding of what's driving and motivating people under it would actually be a good way, I would think, to start to make some of those decisions at a leadership level. And particularly, you know, I really uh, was interested in Andrew's idea about giving some discretion to a manager level where they can, they're working with their team on a day-to-day -day basis and they start to understand that, who they are, particularly if they use this tool, or some, a tool like this, they can start to do that, that so it cuts through much more effectively. And, and that, that's the key that I think is, motivating on a budget is the challenge of our time. We can also understand what kind of work they're best suited for, based on people's attitudes and behaviours, they might be more, we talked about the financial services sector versus the not-for-profit sector versus the accounting industry versus something else. People's behaviour and attitudes will come into that in any, in any conversation, particularly about recruitment. And I'll talk to you about a little bit how we, we match the PI with the PI Pro, which is a, a job test, which I'll get to in just a short, time, a short moment. Um, and also what meets their needs. Um, and what we, you know, I've, I've gone through a fair bit of management training, I've done a lot of postgraduate study, if you, if you like. And what I think, that we're always trying to, um, the challenge I think we're always trying to find when we engage with people, certainly when I recruit, and I, my role here at Man, HLB Manager is HR partner, so I've had a lot of time spent in our strategy around recruitment and retention, we're trying to get that discretionary effort. Um, accountants love to get that bit that you don't have to pay for, and if you can find the right people and what motivates them, it doesn't cost you a direct dollar, then that's going to actually lead to a, a bit of outperformance. <coughs> so that's what, how PI helps you. So, one of the tools that we have started to use a little bit more effectively in the last 12 months or so is the concept of matching the PI and, and I, I, I guess the, how we came to find the PI was a bit of an accident, it was an accidental experience. I, I am part of a, a CEO institute group and they brought a guy in to do it for us and um, I got my report back and it didn't look anything like me and I was really so, my doubt went, Dot point number four, you know, I was really confused. That doesn't work either, that four thing, we should just ditch that. Um, but I worked out, that, but what happened was they give me the standard report, but because of my PI, pro, my PI profile is of such uh, a type, it needed the guy who was selling it to me um, to come and talk to me directly. And when he took me through a, a slightly altered report, 
it really just, it was, it's pretty scary. I don't know if anybody's ever done one of these psych tools, but it scared me. It was like the guy who was writing the report was sitting on the shoulder and listening to everything that was going on inside my head. And so that was where this is the power of the person. And so we started from that perspective, but then when we got to know more of the tool, um, the pro, which is what the job demands, which is this bit on the, on the right over here, and you can actually use the pro as a, of all those people who are going to work with an individual or with a role before you choose your individual, you get the pro to develop based on the act activities and the actions and the outcomes you'd like. And then what you do when you're interviewing people, you get their PI, I think if I do this properly, there you go, you can compare the, 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 the particular behavioural expectations of the individual with the job demands and then you can start to understand how um, you can apply that to that role now you don't what well, we're not suggesting that this is a one uh, it's a one trick pony if you like it's just one of the things in the kit bag you might actually start to ask questions around say a board hiring CEO um, they might ask questions specifically to come out of the PI Pro and the comparison and say how would you deal with situation X would you deal with it in you know, in Y terms, or would you do Z terms, and either of those outcomes is not what the board's comfortable with, and then clearly that would be part of the conversation. It also helps you to align when you're having the conversation around uh, performance coaching, which is another thing that we're starting to sort of find that more and more of our role as accountants and advisors is around coaching our clients, because ultimately every organisation, every business that I've ever worked with is a collection of individuals. And, uh, I may be a bit slow, but it probably took me a long time in my career before I actually worked out that we weren't, we don't have connections with business, we don't have connections with not-for-profits, we have connections with people in those businesses, and we really want to get the best out of them. We really need to start to understand those individuals and challenge and coach those people. In, and, and some of the times it's us, some of the times it's, it's executive coaches or business coaches who might work with us in that regard. But by having this kind of information, it just tells you, give it, again, it's just a little bit more of an extra, um, I guess, a, a tool or, or an added aid for um, people in the business. The one I can get, I think we're using the, uh, the pseudonym Fred today. Well, I was going to call him by his real name, but I'll call him Fred. He's a CEO of mine of a small for-profit business, and he's had four or five people working for him over a period of time. And he's always found that he gets the right guy in the interview. But then six to 12 months later, this guy's an absolute idiot. He doesn't know what he's doing. You know, I tell him what I want. I want to make a lot of money. So he's in the uh, financial services sector, surprisingly. Um, and so he, he's taken us on this journey over the five or six years where we've challenged him around strategy and said, Fred, um, have you in fact got your people behind you on, on the project? And part of what Andrew was saying in his piece was exactly giving them a bit of the information. So we now got him to do that, but the, the big opportunity thing with the PI was we gave him the PI for himself, tick, tick, ha ha, yeah, a lot of nodding, yeah, right, and then we gave it to his people, and then when we said, there's a, there's a bit on the PI process, how I manage and how I like to be managed, it was only when we gave him the insight as to how you manage versus how his people like to be managed that he, he actually <coughs> came back to me about three weeks ago and said, you know, Matt, this has been the biggest uh, insight in my business career, ever. I now he's gone back to be 35, he's gone back through 15 years of experience and said all the times I just didn't get understand why the right, smart, young person who was working for me didn't do what I wanted to do. I think now it might have been, it might have been how I was managing them. And so for us, that was a real, um, I guess, um, what is that, a, a positive, a positive affirmation for us that what we're using with this tool is actually something that's quite valuable. And, um, I know I've got a couple of my business partners in the room and I should, uh, Kate, my colleague, has shown it to them and we're now starting to really believe that this is actually what might actually help us to understand and drive performance in the future with some of the projects we undertake with our business clients and very much for, for myself in the not-for-profit sector. So that's what you can do with it. Um, so it's not just a hiring tool, it's actually also a coaching tool. And what we found, it gives us a little bit, is anybody familiar with Jahari, the Jahari window? You. Yeah, so this is the concept of um, uh, Andrew again, and referencing it lady, I think I had more than a free lunch for me next time, um, is 
this concept of, 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 of what we know and the feedback that we get, and uh, it, it, it doesn't surprise me that um, the, the concept about managers needing, knowing to have a, a monthly meeting to give some kind of check-in with their people, because in my experience, that's not just um, default behaviour. Uh, it might be default behaviour with those eight-year-old kids who want to be HR professionals, but it's not default behaviour in broader business. And what we've discovered is that the, 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 the Jahari window concept is this what is known to me and what is known to others. And it's the blind spot there that the bit that is known to others but not known to self is one of the key outcomes when we start to, to make people comfortable with the conversation about how do I like to be spoken to, how do I like to be managed, how much control do I have over a project, how much control do I need in my life versus how much um, independence do I need, what leadership do I need, all those factors that make up do I want to be a part of the, part of the team or do I want to be the leader of the team. And so what we've actually found is that's a really good eye opener and for my, for my client Fred, that was something that he discovered is that to him it was known to others that he's a bit of a pushy boss, but now it's known to him because we actually took him through this process. And fortunately, you know, the big part of this is we share it with the team. So it's not like we give everybody their, their, their PI and then we go away. We actually get them together and workshop it with them so that they all understand each other. And we do it in a fairly, particularly given, depending on the team, do it in different ways. We make it a very non-confrontational, let's make this a learning experience together kind of experience. Um, so that blind spot, um, of course those of you who go to dinner parties, this is what's happening in the Jahari window at the dinner party. Um, we discuss the dinner parties, what's known to you and known to others. Um, when you go to the loo, that's the bit that they're doing in this corner. Um, that's Jokes aren't very good, that might be something that comes out really, suits disgraceful, um, something like that. The bit, you know, everyone's at secret life, the Elvis impersonators in the room, feeling a little uncomfortable. Anyway, probably enough on that. So one of the things is, the, the, the second question, um, once you get your own, is, um, you know, is like, the first question is, is, is this, can this be right, is this really me, particularly if we didn't read those bits about the areas for development, is which is better? So we're going to talk about the factors of, of what make up the PI in a second, but um, it's which is better, higher or lower, dominance versus extroversion versus patience versus formality. All these things, um, what we feel is that the, this is, and I've found this of myself over the many, many years I've been doing stuff like this, um, the work in life is on the self. So this is, um, if you can change the world, uh, you, if you can change yourself, you can perhaps change the world, that kind of approach. So rather than it always being, you know, have you ever noticed, met those people, they go, there's just something wrong with the world, nobody else gets me. Um, <laughs> this is a great tool for having that conversation with those people, but maybe there's a few things we can work on together. But having said that, it's not like saying, putting people into a box either. So this is not about saying, Oh, you're a that. I mean, I've done Myers-Briggs before, and everybody loves to, to quote their Myers-Briggs, and if you're an E, fantastic. If you're an I, you boring well up. We don't want to hang around with you. It's, it's not like that. It's actually that, that to create a great team, what we believe that to get projects over the line, you need a mix of all these different aspects. So it's really important that, um, that we, we acknowledge what our strengths and our development areas are, um, but also acknowledge that um, strengths overplay become a weakness. So if you say, well, look, you know, I'm a high extroversion, so you guys have just got to put up with that and just know that I'm always going to blurt out my ideas before you guys get a chance to think about it. I knew quiet people, can you, look, if you can't come prepared to the meeting, be willing to speak up right now, then I'm just going to go with what I think. That's a strength overplay, because if you have all the introverted people sitting there and never sharing an idea, you never get that group think. So we've got to make sure that we try and encourage an environment that uh, brings out the best in everybody based on this knowledge, and that's what we feel this tool is really useful for. Um, somebody said, uh, that often says to me, is it uh, some style more annoying or high maintenance than others? Um, it all comes down to perceptions, really. I mean, um, I found it interesting. Does anybody think they're overpaid? You know, 4% of people think that. Does anybody think they're particularly annoying at a dinner party? <laughs> Rarely will anybody say, yeah, don't invite me to a dinner party because you, I never shut up and I tell really bad jokes and I'm a bore and I drink too much and fall down and nobody would ever say that. But we all, in fact, know those kinds of people where they might just need a little nudge to remind them, usually by right. So it's really a perception thing, and just to demonstrate perception. Uh, that's the thing about change being all about yourself. but. What it, 
People may have seen this picture before, but what do you see? Do you see the old lady or do you see the young lady? Who sees the old lady? Both. Who said both? <laughs> you clever people. Does anybody not see a woman at all? <laughs> oh, there's a couple. So the whole point of this is that the old lady is, that's her hair there, and sure that's her nose. The young lady is facing the other way. Um, often we'll put this up and some people for a period of time cannot see one or the other. And it's how that, so that's a perception thing. And it's interesting when we work with groups, uh, and, and many of you might have find this in your own team, some people just can't see whatever it is you're taking them on the journey. And it's not until you take a step back and say, well, am I communicating the way that I like to be communicated to, or am I communicating the way that they need to be communicated to to take them on the journey that we're trying to take them along? So the perception's really important. An easier one for the guys who didn't get that. So what do we see there? A rabbit or a duck? Bye, bye. Some people see one first, some see it first, some don't see a rabbit or a duck at all. Um, but again, this is the stuff that we talk to teams about all the time. It's just where we're coming from in frame. And I think um, as business and financial advisors, we often come in with a hammer. We, over the years, I've come in and said, you need a cash flow, you need this, or you need to change this about your team. It's not until you start to really have the conversations now around our team structures and who's in the team, who the leader of the team is, that we can really start to supercharge how you might get better results. So as people here who are CEOs or HR directors or other senior roles in organisations, this can be the kind of thing where it starts to give you a little bit of an insight into um, you know, what, where the gaps may be in the team, where your blind spots may be, should I say. So that's the perceptions. Um, so what it's measuring when you do a PI, it measures on four factors. And um, on a simple high-low, um, so dominance is all about the desire for an individual to be in control and command of their, of their situation. So that they like to be in teams where they play the leading role, they like to be shine, a lot of their own empathy is high. On the low end, it's I like to be guided, I like strong leadership, and I like to take my time you know, within the role, I'll take, I'll take a back seat as it were. Uh, the extroversion is not that loud person at the party, it's actually the way that we do our thinking. For those who are uh, familiar with Myers-Briggs, it's a similar thing to how you do, are you an introverted thinker where you go away, you like to reflect before you share, or are you a person who tends to go and bounce your ideas around with four or five other people before you come to a conclusion on a decision. Um, the whole, th the, the challenge with these is just to make sure that the high-low, you're just balancing within a team. If you've got a lot of low, you might need to have a different style if you're suddenly bringing a high person who won't see that. Uh, patience is all about the speed. Um, so do people like a faster moving environment or are they willing to go along sort of just in a, a sort of more consistent uh, role over a longer period of time? Um, the thing about the low, the patience, if somebody's got low patience, so they've got high speed in an environment where there's change, and um, I was talking to one of the ladies here before about organisations as they, you know, particularly not for profit sector, where there's so much going on in your sector right now that is changing. And there's a lot of people who are probably used to uh, a sector that was used to a certain amount of funding or a certain size of funding and style of funding. As those things change, there may be people in your business who have very high levels of patience and not willing to change, or not, not necessarily, not willing, but a little bit suspicious perhaps of it. Somebody who would come into your team who say a consultant externally who's got a low patience, wants a lot of energy and pace, it's got, if they've got low, they're going to ex, um, exaggerate anything on the right-hand side. So anything that's high on the other side is overplayed. So if they come in and they're a little bit dominant with low patience, they're going to be really dominant. So they're going to be really bullish and overplay that. Um, they're going to have lots of ideas of the extroverted. Um, the last piece is formality. Um, so this is the need for structure and rules. So some people, uh, the governance people, and they're important, a bit more dynamic, need to have a few rule breakers to challenge the, the accepted status quo. So when I say rule breakers, I didn't say breaking any laws, just breaking <laughs> rules. Rules are not laws. We're not a, 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 a job manager. We do never encourage rules. <laughs> <them. laughs> um, so there you go. So when you, when you do your PI, what it basically does is it gives you a bit of an idea, and this is where I'll sort of link it back in with what Andrew was saying. The motivating needs of people who are low dominance versus high dominance. So low dominance people need encouragement, reassurance and strong leadership. High dominance people need opportunities to prove themselves on a level of independence. Um, the extroversion, so low is all about private or personal recognition. So you don't go up to um, 
social media, I think, is a really interesting thing. You know, if you don't get liked, well, people who've got large division don't care, right? It's not a market for them. They'd rather you go into their office and say, look, you did a really good job on that project, blah, blah, blah. Um, on the other end, they like, you know, wipe them to hell, you know, Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. Um, they like prestige and status, they like to own the lectern, they like to be in the front of the room telling the gags, even if they don't go down as well as they have today. <laughs> uh, patience, so as I said, low patience is a variety and change of pace, so mobility, movement all the time, so that you don't get a person with low patience, they won't stay around and do the same thing forever, they want to change that. Whereas people with high patience tend to be wanting to have a stable work environment. Um, and loyalty and seniority. So the people who were setting those, um, the, the award standards before about how you get remunerated every year, they were probably very much on the high patience level because they just wanted to hang around. Um, formality, as I said, so freedom from rigid structure is low formality. So the more tight the control, a person with low formality is going to get a little bit frustrated by that. Whereas you, you might be surprised in the accounting business, we have quite a few people who have high formality. Uh, like structure, certainty, <laughs> that's the way it gets done. I don't want to have a crack at so no, I won't. <laughs> so but there are people, that, but the whole point of this, this is how it measures, so that's the motivating need. So if I think about what Andrew was saying about how are you going to bring people into a, a remunerational, um, uh, 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 how do you motivate and, and encourage people to outperform, and some of it might be about remuneration, but some of it is that word. Um, but some of it or just might be understanding a little bit about what's driving these people, particularly around, I think, uh, the recognition piece. Uh, public recognition for some people is enough. Well, it's not everything, but it's, 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 it might be that little piece of extra that gets them over line. Give them that project or challenge them to give them that extra opportunity. Of course, with your motivating needs, there's also opportunities. So, um, again, um, we tend to find People with low dominance don't know how to say no, they'll be the people taking you on because they don't speak up. Um, they, their opportunity might be speaking up or learning to say no. High dominance is dialing back your assertiveness. So if you really have a dominant person who never shuts up, it's like, hey, somebody might just need to have that conversation with them. Um, extroversion, again, trusting in others if you're low. Um, extroversion, I tend to find people, I have seen people with that low extroversion piece here, they want to do it all themselves because other people just don't get it right. Um, if you match that up with somebody who's um, high on formality, then you know, that's a control. They just won't let much go. So there's coaching opportunities within, within each of these areas. And, and in our experience, this is what we've done. We've taken people on the journey and said, this is your team, uh, challenge the individual, uh, challenge the group to challenge each other. So for us, how this plays out in a workshop is we get them to understand each other and once they understand each other, then when they get set to the project work, they know who they might allocate to different parts of the project. So who might lead the project team, who's going to do some of the detail. Um, and what we find is if you find out who these people are and they're going, yeah, this is me, they might actually start to volunteer for that stuff. So it actually takes you on a journey and I think that if I can get somebody on my team to do something willingly because it's, it's, it fits right in their box, um, I'm going to get a much better outcome than if I have to push them. Or